one of the ones you spelt right. I know. Jesus. <laughs> right. Um, just commenting on you my turn. Right. Let's go into right. the team of the week then. So, number one, we've got Alex Hodgman. Two, James Parsons. Uh, three, uh, Casey Lalala. Uh, four, Patrick Good start. <laughs> that's, that's the um, that one. <laughs> um, top two Pilotta, isn't it? Two Pilotti. Yeah, two Pilotti. Cool. Right. Adding two Pilotti. Lovely. Let's see if I can pronounce all these players for our team of the week. <laughs> Good day, and in the week that rugby will return to Australia as the force awakens, Matt Giddo signs for the LA Guillotines, and Gloucester, looking like they're going to be get done for tapping up George Skivington whilst he was still under contract, I'd like to introduce a man who likes tapping up and going to the bar. It's Johnny Sheldrake. How you doing? <laughs> Evening. I'm good, thanks. Cheers. And next, I'd like to introduce the man who he still can't believe that Gloucester have been so stupid to have even contacted and humoured Skivington in the first place. It's Joe Tricky. How's it going? And finally, <laughs> he's a man that's getting very excited about the legal prospects of London Irish taking down Gloucester. It's Harry Berryman. Good evening, Johnny. And I'm Johnny Hayes, and I'm wearing a cap this week, and this is the Rock and Wall <laughs> podcast. Right, this week uh, is a really action-packed one. We've got a review of round three of Super Rugby, Aotearoa, as the Blues battle past the hyped-up Highlanders, and Reese and Jordan combine twice to dampen the Chiefs. Uh, we will also discuss our team of the week and um, some key players to watch out for. Um, and we will then also begin to preview games for uh, Super Rugby, uh, Arturo uh, round four. But let's start with the game of the weekend, admittedly on Saturday, where the Blues claimed a 27 24 victory uh, in Eden, uh, Eden Park. And let's start with the question really to you, Harry, is um, how far is Caleb Clark away from being the next All Black winger? Well, it's a good question. I think the key will be the match against the Crusaders. Um, because the Blues have spent so much of the first three games of the tournament in control of the matches, and uh, Clark has had quite a lot of help, obviously, with Rico Ioane and um, Bowden Barrett sort of within his area. There isn't much opportunity for any other team to expose any weaknesses that he does have. So if anybody can, it'll be the Crusaders, so we can really see um, whether or not He's got that at the moment. I'm sure. I'm sure they'll give him a go in the next in the next tour. I'm sure he'll be on that plane um, off the back of these few weeks. Even if he got injured right now, I'm sure they would want to give him a go. Um, but yeah, it's looking quite exciting. Especially I, I remember first seeing him play last year, and he was obviously well hyped because of who his father was playing mm. for the Blues in the nineties. But and obviously his sevens work, but he wasn't that good. Um, you can see there was something, but it wasn't amazing. But he's really stepped up this year. And I'd be surprised. The Blues have got a few other talented wingers, but I'd be very surprised if Clark was dropped on form alone. He might be rested, but not not soon. Um, Joe, anything particularly the, that popped out for you about the Blues in, in this victory, really? Um, well, kind of just to go back to Caleb Clark just a little bit, I think that, he has really shown his class over the last few games. We talked about coming in, about how excited we were to see Mark Talea, and he was the leading try scorer going into Artiro after the first few rounds of matches before the lockdown. And really, although Talea has played well, and scored a few tries, Clark's definitely been the standout. Um, and even last week, round two, when it was quite poor weather um, and the back line wasn't really used as much, I still thought he had a good game, still carried quite well and still made a few breaks. So clearly he's still able to play well under conditions that don't 100% suit him. But yeah, if, when you, if you're asking about whether if he's going to be the next All Black, the current in, um, incumbent All Blacks in the back three, certainly on the wing, are at the Crusaders. So that matchup's going to be tasty, kind of whoever he's up against in that back line. Um, aside from that, from the Blues, I guess it is really just another 
good performance. Um, it wasn't kind of amazing. It didn't blow our socks off uh, like some portions of other matches have, have. It was close against the Highlanders, which we didn't expect might happen, but the weather came into it. But it was just another kind of example of them grinding out wins. And, and that's what good teams do, even when they're not playing really, really well and when the conditions don't 100% suit them. They're still winning matches, and that's something I don't think the Blues have been that used to doing over the last few years. Um, marshalled quite well by the likes of Bodie Barrett, Satuti having another good game again. Clark making some breaks, Yuani some breaks. So another performance where most players are popping up and, and supporting and offering help um, kind of from 1 to 15, which I think is going to be really important for them. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think I... I think it's happened every week now. I just need to keep apologising to James Parsons. Mm, he's played really well. I mean, yeah. Really, yeah. really impressed by him in most of these games I've watched up until this season. I don't know what's changed, um, but he's looking bigger. He's much more effective. His lineups has been his lineups have been as good as anyone in New Zealand. That and blue, yeah, that Blues lineups made a grubber quality. When was the last time we saw a hooker do a grubber as good as that? Oh, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> he was so pleased with it as well. That's what yeah, he was. Play. He was so pleased with himself. Yeah, no, he's he's been one of the Blues players of the tournament so far, just on the basis of his improvement alone, never mind his pure performance. He's been fantastic. Just in, in the in the front row, and I'll bring come back to the lineup point in a minute. But that um, with Hodgman as well, Hodgman who's sort of been solid again for the Blues. He really put his hand above the parapets this weekend. Some brilliant carries, great um, work rate around the park, and he was on for about seventy minutes, I think, um, at least if not more. Um, but that Blues lineout was so strong that the the fact of how quickly they could form them all and the, the, with the uh, Papali second try, yeah. that beautiful, well-set maul that the Highlanders actually defended reasonably well throughout the game. And the Highlanders, again, had a strong set piece, which we'll probably maybe talk about in a moment. But they, yeah, th- that was, again, it was a crucial turning point in the game where the, Highland, where the Highlanders had come back in the game at that point for them to really express uh, their, their thing on that. Uh, John, have you got any stats, worthy stats about the Blues game from the Blues point of view or anything like that? For me, about the stats, no, the only stat I would point out from the weekend is the penalty counts. Um, I know the weather plays a, plays a factor and I know it's not kind of jumping ahead, but first round there were 58 penalties in the two games. Second round there were 49. This round there were 23. I know we could talk about the second game and it was a bit relaxed, maybe the rules, but I think the penalty count was a lot lower. Um, and I think it probably allows the, the team that's attacking more and has has more options to actually um uh, actually look look better at in overall in the overall position and not relying on penalty counts. Yeah, I think they've we as we sort of expected them to and um, you'd be quite disappointed if they didn't. They, the teams have really done very well to adapt to these new rules. Um, I imagine it's, it's clearly very difficult for them in that first week, but yeah, I completely agree. They've done very well to get used to it. I'm sure the referees have been coming into training and talking them through it, um, but it's, it's easy to talk it through. It's hard to change your habits. Done really well. Okay, let's let's really let's move on to the Highlanders' point of view then. And I, and I think with the Highlanders, they again they for me they uh, had in the first firstly in the first ten minutes anyway they sort of seem to have changed their defensive structure, which is a bit more aggressive. Um, I think after that ten minutes, it sort of they relaxed off a little bit, and obviously the Cade of Clark try came quite early on, um, but that was quite. A little bit push for for further back, but again, they they've got the potential there. The Highlanders again. Aaron Smith was really good. Um, I potentially again on Friday was a bit critical for of um, of Hunt being at fly half, Mitch Hunt, but he was he had a storm of a game. That was a brilliant oh. try. Cut a yeah. lovely little line, set a dummy and good, and went under the under the sticks for a try that they really pushed themselves right back in the game. There, it. Yeah. I just feel with the Highlanders that they just need a bit of X factor. They just need something a little bit different. I think I worry, like, I, 
I know I, I watched the F1 uh, Drive to Survive documentary in the week uh, on Netflix. And if you've not seen it, go check it out. It's really, really interesting. And they, the, in this season, they have Red Bull, had, it, from the 2019 season, they had Pierre Gass, uh, Gasny, who, who was at Toro Rosso, really, really promising young driver. And Red Bull dumped him after eight, uh, after eight races. Uh, and I could just, so they're throwing a young guy into the, into the PowerPoint. I hope that doesn't happen to uh, Gregory, because in all fairness, Gregory had an absolute stinker of a game. In, in, a, in comparisons when we were looking at the weather in the Crusaders and Islanders game, and you've got Jordan and Mackenzie not dropping a single ball, for him to just make a couple of mistakes in there. He's a young lad, he's 21, he's definitely going to come back stronger, but I hope they don't suddenly go pull the plug on him um, for having a complete shocker. I, can I think they it. rely on. Oh, sorry, John. I think they rely on him to create some, have some creativity at the back as well. Um, I don't think outside of like Aaron Smith, Mitch Hunt, but they didn't seem to have much anyone with that spark, like you said, in the outside backs. It was really setting them alight. Yeah, and I, so just I think, think they need they needed someone to keep get them going, basically, in the way McKenzie does for the Chiefs. Completely agree. I think most of these teams have, in fact, really most teams in top level professional rugby have worked out that you do need two playmakers um, somewhere in the back line other than your, so your 10 and then another. Um, and I think that's, that's probably why Major tried out um, Josh Uwani at 12 before the break um, because the Highlanders, their regular centres and their um, outs, more outside backs they're not really playmakers in any sense of the word. They're all strike runners in the sense of Tomkinson and Thompson yeah. or basically quick guys um, in to, in for the, all of the outside backs, whereas most of the other teams have a bit more variation there. They've got a 12 who can pass a bit more in um, good hue at the Crusaders or have got fullbacks who are really effective distributors like the Chiefs and the Blues. So... I appreciate it's very, very difficult to replicate that if it's just not your game. And I think that's something the Highlanders are struggling from. Um, their pack was so impressive, though, this week, the Highlanders. They're both, obviously, their mall defence was struggled a bit against the Blues, but mm -hmm. their, their technique for pick and goes close to the line, you don't see teams do that well. Scoring two really, really nice, one guy goes, two latch onto the back of him, push him over for both Frizzell and Dixon's tries. It's very difficult to get that right. And they've clearly, I mean, Exeter to do that well in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's not really something that they're known for in New Zealand or Super Rugby generally. But if that's picked up and the All Blacks get good at it, then <laughs> there's no hope for the rest of us. Yeah. This is, uh, I think they showed that in the first game as well against, against the Chiefs, that mm -hmm. they were just so good close to the line. And actually... <laughs> They're playing the conditions because I know it's a few weeks later than the Super Rugby may maybe would have ended, and they've still got many weeks to go. But it's coming into kind of deep winter in New Zealand, and the conditions yeah. aren't great. And that they're basically doing well to play to the conditions. They're, yeah, they're pro we talked a bit about last week that the Crusaders and the Blues are going to probably pull away, and it will be a two-horse race probably for the title because um, the other three teams at the moment. As I say, as John Kirkman keeps alluding to, it's a sprint, not a long season. So they're probably there, unless the Blues and the Crusaders slip up, it's going to be very hard for those teams to get in. But the Highlanders especially are the best of the rest, if that makes sense at the moment. They've got a strong scrum. They've got a strong line out. They may not have the, 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 the household names, but they've got a core set of All Blacks that when they do step up, they make an impact. Aaron Smith... Sharon Frizzell had a better, a much better game uh, than he has. You've got Tomkinson and, uh, and Thompson in the centre that are very reliable in that regard. So they, they are going to cause the Hurricanes and Chiefs um, some problems. Um, so, yeah, I think they're, they're in a good place. They just got to get, get, have that, take their opportunities, which they didn't, didn't take at some times in that Blues game. Well, to be frank, they're, they're basically what we expected the Chiefs to be. They're just really, really hard to beat with a very organised pack. And we saw how difficult it was for the Blues. Obviously, the Highlanders were very good um, when they beat the Chiefs 
in the, in the first week. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how well they can hold out the Crusaders. Um, that's really the test for every team in this tournament. Um, but the Highlanders have made that made their defence and their pack as good as as good as any of them, and so they've done very well in that regard. Does anyone else have any just, points before we move on? Yeah, Joe. Sorry. Yeah, just a little bit. Um, we'll speak about it a little bit because it came up again in the in the next match. But there's a really interesting stat about um, the playmaker balance, and we're talking about the fact that most of these quality teams have a second playmaker. And um, so for the off nine, the Blues had 50% of their play from the scrum half, whether the Hollanders had 59%. Um, off 10, only 22% for the Blues, 25% for the Highlanders. And then off 15, 28% for the Blues and 16% uh, for the Highlanders. So you can see it's quite heavily skewed for the Highlanders towards Aaron Smith at nine and for the Blues, Bowden Barrett at 15. So that kind of shows you it's a lot more spread out with the Blues. They've got more options. And we've been speaking about that, how they use their options and how they um, use those two playmakers really well. And Bowden Barrett actually coming in at first receiver more often than the fly half. So it shows you even with a 15 on his back, he's still doing quite a lot of those, those fly half duties. Uh, with the Highlanders, they're just so heavily reliant. Two thirds of their play coming from Aaron Smith at nine. And that just shows you how kind of one dimensional they are potentially in that back line. And that's the, the problem that they might have. Do so, yeah, go on, Johnny. Go on, Johnny. No, no, go oh. on. Johnny and Johnny. So, just just on that note, um, I think that the Josh Ioni might be back soon. Apparently, I saw an interview around Major, Major after the Major after the game. He said potentially that Ioni might be back soon, and also Milner Scudder, yeah, which is two that, op, yeah. two 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 playmakers. And apparently he's getting close as well, but that could completely change the dynamic of that back line, which would be an interesting one. They, they, they need... If the Highlanders need a player, yes, Milner Scutter would be useful and he's electric. We can all see what we can do. If you go back and watch 2015 to see how he d took the World Cup by storm, but they need Josh Ioni back at fly half. They, as I say, Mitch Hunt proved me wrong and he'd have had a much better game and he was solid and he put, played the game plan to perfection. He kicked well. Uh, he marshaled the game well with Smith that he did that he did better than, he, than they were against the Chiefs in round one. But Ione's got something class. He takes the ball to the line. He offers a bit more like the likes of Cruden, like Mwanga, these more established fly halves, as it were. So for him to come back would be it's going to will take the hinders up to the is up to the next level, and just on really on fly halves just very quickly is if you are Liam McDonald, you've won three games out of three now, you've got you're going into your bye week and then the week after you're playing the Crusaders. Is there a need for Dan Carter to be in this Blues team at the moment? Not in, not as a player. I think he's quite clearly helping out as effectively as a skills coach um, and a, a person to have in the camp. But I don't, I don't think they need him to play anytime soon. Because I, I was just thinking, like, I, I, at the start of the year, I was like, oh, a Terra Black, fine at 10. He'll have one, one week in and then they'll move Barrett to, um, to 10. But as I said, we, we talked about the second playmakers. I really like Barrett at 15. And I think un, until they, the Blues lose or they need something to change something, then he'll stay there, I think, because that's it worked exceptionally well. Barrett hasn't taken this competition by the world by the storm. He's not been the player we've seen where he's scored six tries in a game and being ridiculous like that. But he's not needed to be. He's been cool, calm, and collective from the front, which is really, really good to see. So, um, yeah, it's just it's just an interesting point that I wanted to bring up. Um, let's move on then to the. Sunday's game with the Crusaders and the Chiefs. Uh, the Crusaders edging out a 18-13 win in the end. Um, being the difference really being the uh, the Reese and Jordan connection. Two tries, two two tries for Will Jordan, two try assists from Sever Reese. Um, yeah, let, let's really start with that then. Really, how especially that first try? How good was that? Unreal. Yeah, really, really impressed with Seven Reese in that. 
Yeah, yeah so and I was, I, was, I was intrigued to see Sebi Reese go off early in the second half. Um, I don't know whether he was injured or they just decided they needed a change of pace, but I don't, he didn't look injured as he went off, but he was great. And he, he, is, he is just kind of willing just to suddenly put that injection of pace into the game when he gets the ball. Even if they're going slowly, he just puts that pace into the game, which I think is, is great in a team when you just need forward ball and they're, and they're, and they're away. It, 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 on the substitution for Reese, it was interesting because he just said he walked, he went off the pitch five, 50 minutes. And I was like, it was strange. They brought Havili on and Havili went to 15 and Jordan went out to the wing. And I was a bit like, why don't you give Fungonuku a go? Maybe they thought Havili's a safer option as the weather's coming in. They want to defend the lead. And Havili had a good game. He made, he nearly cost them the game though, <laughs> two times that. He kicked the he ran the ball back in his twenty two, booted it straight out, and then I don't know what he's doing, but the Chiefs props knocked it on, and he's chucked an inside ball to Goodhue, who then Goodhue's not been able to kick it anywhere, and the Chiefs allowed one more attack. So I was I was nearly a bit like oh, but he was it was interesting off the bench. I was just going to say we don't want to spend too much on this game because it was a bit non-eventful because of the weather, and Joe will probably talk in a moment about. The, the different game plans of that. But the Crusaders had a game plan, which they stuck to. They they seemed to clearly address the issues they had last week. Their defence was phenomenal. And that was really why the Chiefs really couldn't break it down. There was a highlight in the first half where McKen- they go at the, the Chiefs are attacking left. McKenzie swings back and literally tries and runs around the outside of the Crusaders and he gets nailed. Um, they were defended absolutely brilliantly. And that was summarised by... Um, by Colin Grace, 20, 21 tackles, nine dominant carries. What again? Twenty twenty one years old. What a, what a game? Uh, the the Crusaders. Yeah, fantastic. Man. Yeah, they're looking strong. They had a game plan. They executed it. They play in the right area. It, 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 again, they 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 compare them to the Hinders, where they've got well, the Hinders have got some New Zealanders. With the Crusaders, the amount that they have is is the main reason why they are where they where they are, where they are in that regard. Um, but the, my, the point that I wanted to raise and was really, I'll start with Johnny really is, um, how could the Chiefs won, Chiefs won that game? How could they have won the game? Had the, had the energy that they had in the last 10 minutes in the, in the rest of the game, I felt that they didn't really look for gaps or were willing to run with anyone but McKenzie for the rest for, for the rest of the game. Um, it just seemed as if it was kind of, there was a lot of McKenzie just drifting across the pitch. Um, and I don't think they were necessarily direct enough or at points actually kind of parenting with that. They played, they played in the wrong areas. The Chiefs had a very good kicking game. Um, their nine and 10 were kicking well. And I, didn't really feel like Brad Weber or McKenzie, in fact, were kicking that great out of hand. McKenzie had a few good where he would switch it completely, switch the play and kick it right across the park. But they weren't playing in the right areas of the field. And especially in the conditions that they needed to be in the right areas just to put pressure on the Crusaders. Because unless you were constantly putting pressure on the Crusaders, they're very good at kind of dissipating it and their defence was so good that they needed just to keep the pressure on in the right areas yeah. it was they, they again as I say they made too many mistakes as well at crucial times and that was when they were camped on the line towards the game where Havili had made the mistake and they, they forced the knock on I was going to say pick up on the wing really was sure how Sean Wainui really took it to the Crusaders when they came back after half time made some great carries, made a great break. It was, oh, that, it was in, just turning into the second half where Cody Taylor, they talked about it in the game, how Cody Taylor defends at the back because he's such a strong defender. That line from uh, Wainui, he could have gone the whole length, but that is an incredible tackle. I don't think, if you, if you are just a, a even bystander watching that game, think, oh, that's fair enough, he's made a tackle, but that is a seriously incredible tackle where Wainui is running full tilt on the angle He's flat-footed him, Cody Taylor, and how has he made that tackle is incredible, really. It is. And, and that's why the Crusaders are going are gonna to go on, because they've got players that can do that. Because if, yeah. if you take, if you, let's say you take 
uh, Cody Taylor out of that and put someone else in there, another hooker from the, the competition, he doesn't make that tackle. Why do he goes the length and the Chiefs are back in the game? No, I completely agree. I think, I'm not sure who it was, I think it was Charlie Morgan, um, the Telegraph's rugby correspondent, who had a, um, used a really good metaphor, actually going back to your Formula One uh, point from earlier, Johnny, that the individuals in the Crusaders team who you don't necessarily see as yet being superstars, like Cullen Grace, like Will Jordan, um, like Seve Reese was last year, um, but obviously he's a bit more established now, they are effectively in this current Mercedes car mm. where you might be a very good player, but the, si the whole system around you means you are, the ver you are able to be the very, very best version of yourself. Like Shannon Frizzell has to do a lot of work for the Highlanders to have anywhere near the impact on a game that, the, that Cullen Grace does because the rest of Shannon Frizzell's pack is not that good. I mean, it's obviously quite good, but Cullen Grace is the one that everyone's talking about, even though Frizzell is no worse an individual player if you just compare them one, one by one. Um, and Will Jordan just had a much more impressive game than Damian McKenzie. Damian yeah. McKenzie is the all-black incumbent. Will Jordan is a 20, 21-year-old in his first season or first full season. Um, and the, the structure around them is just so much better and get so much more out of these players that you just wish you could replicate it somewhere. I know Bath are trying to with, um, I forget his name now, but anyway, taking a Crusaders coach and seeing what, they, seeing what he can do, but it's not really working yet. But if this could be replicated, rugby as a whole would be much, much better. Yeah. I just think that it's, it again goes back to those options you're talking about is that yeah. the Crusaders just have so many options. They can play off various areas. And Damien McKenzie was kind of, I just thought he was relied upon so much. Yeah. And it was a kind of battle of the fullbacks and Jordan came out on top. Um, but it wasn't necessary because McKenzie had a bad game. He was just given so much ball that it was obvious that when something didn't go well, that McKenzie was involved in that play necessarily. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree. I think he had to say because Jordan gets two tries, he doesn't drop the ball. Mackenzie drops one ball, but he again plays well at kicking the ball out of hand, and that's maybe why he didn't quite make it in the team of the week. But he would have gone in there. But again, I think we're looking at the Crusaders in the sense that they are probably the best club rugby side in the world. I mean, Leicester might, Leinster might, sorry, might put their hands up and rival that, but they've got a game for every eventuality. Like you saw there, they, they've got. The rain that was in the sense that everything came off nine. And if you looked at the Crusaders carrying, they carried very narrow and they didn't actually run uh, from out to in. Um, but they, they, can, they have that ability just to tur turn it on. And um, yeah, I think that's really why we're going to see them in two weeks' time against the Blues with the, where will be a clear game of where this is going. But let's wrap that up then and we'll move on to Team of the Week. Let's see if I can pronounce all these players for our Team of the Week then. So we've got, at uh, number one, we've got um, Alex Hodgman. Then we've got James Parsons at number two. Uh, Lava, what was it again? Nepo La La La. -la. Uh, so number three, we've got Nepo La La La. Four <laughs> is Patrick Tupolotu. We've got Dixon at five. Cullen Grace at six. Dalton Papali, he's seven. Hoskins Satutu continues to be our number eight. Uh, Aaron Smith, um, Caleb Clark on the left wing, Jack, uh, Jack Goodhue in inside centre, Rico Iwani, and then Sean Wainui and Will Jordan complete the backs. Um, Johnny, who's your player of the week? Uh, Will Jordan. I think he was just, it was a battle of the fullbacks, Crusaders versus the Chiefs, and he just came out on top. Um, I don't think Mackenzie had a bad game. I just think Jordan kind of has really settled into that role well. Two tries and links with Seve Reese, and he just he did did what he needed to do on the day. And I think he did well in the conditions, especially kind of moving to wing in the second half. He just continued to shine. Yeah. Uh, Harry, what are your thoughts on your player of the week? I think it's the it's the James Parson apology tour. Really, <laughs> um, he's. In, in terms of my apologies to him, this is the culmination of that. I think a 
34, 35-year-old hooker doing a grubber that Dan Carter would be proud of. I think that's that's all you really need to know. Perfect lineouts, good carries, and a lovely grubber. That's all you need. Love the grubber. Tricky. Uh, for me, it's Caleb Clark. Um, just, yeah, we've spoken about it briefly already, but is looking really, really promising in that Blues back line. It looks like they've got superstars all over the park, but he's the one that's really sticking his hand up and um, yeah, scoring the tries, making the breaks, um, looks solid in defence from what we've seen. Um, we, we don't really see too much wrong with his game at the moment. Um, we might find that in, in future weeks, but just really can't wait for that Crusaders battle against Severus and George Bridge. It's going to be tasty. Yeah, totally. So mine's going to be um, back in the forward pack is cut number six, Cullen Grace, uh, the Crusaders six, the little ginger. Um, I wish <laughs> I could be. I wish I could have been a good early player as him. As they top the tackles this week at twenty one, um, unbelievable. The hit that he did on Leonard Brown in the second half, where Brown thought he was going to go down the corner, he absolutely smashed him and sent him back home um, to Waikato. So yeah, Cullen Grace for me was uh, the player of the week with that. Uh, let's do some quick predictions then uh, before we move into Super Rugby AU. Um, next week's games are, uh, the Blues are off, but it's the Crusaders uh, versus the Highlanders up in uh, Otago. Uh, initial thoughts on that? Balls, anyone? Going to be a good test. Um, yeah. The Highlanders have had a bye, haven't they? This isn't their fourth game on the trot. No, they, yeah, they had a bye last week. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it'll be interesting to see how they do. The we- obviously, the weather again will have an effect. The Highlanders will struggle if the Crusaders are in the dry and can really open up. But in the wet, you can see the Highlanders keeping it close in the same way that the Chiefs did. Yeah, I think of all the teams, um, the Highlanders look to have quite a strong pack and that's definitely their strength. If it does, if it does end up wet, um, it can end up quite a close battle like we saw with... Um, the Crusaders and the Chiefs uh, this week with the Highlanders having a slightly stronger pack. So I'm quite, I'm actually weird, weird for me that I'm hoping for rain and wet weather because you, you don't really want the Crusaders to win every single match. It's a little bit boring. So we'd like to have a little bit of a challenge. Um, but then by that same token, if it does end up being dry, it could be a really exciting match and quite a high score line. So um, two potentially exciting matches depending on which way the weather goes. Yeah, I was just going to say on that, we've the important stuff is that it's in the Forsyth Bar Stadium, so they've got the closed roof, so there's no rain, so the Crusaders are going to cut absolutely, unfortunately. <laughs> I love the car, they love the Highlanders to pieces. Oh. Um, but but would, Crusaders, if it plays into their hands, would they not just open the roof? Or is it closed? Think it's it's a complete closed uh, okay. thing. Um, well, they, why do they do that? They built, it. they built it when they had bloody Wasiki Naholo and Fekatan <laughs> back line. Now they pissed off to England. Yeah. <laughs> they on a scudder back on the pitch. Um, and unfortunately, the the fact that they've playing at home is going to be the undoing. Um, <laughs> they're going to be in their fans. I think Crusade is going to cut, cut them apart. Um, I love the Highlanders for absolute pieces, but you can see the Crusaders, what they did to the Hurricanes two, uh, last weekend, I think they'll do the same here. Five, six tries. Uh, the Highlanders will score, hopefully, but I think the, the Crusaders will cut loose. Um, just quickly on that um, I don't know if is this the first game that the Highlanders have had back at home um, they started at first home. game at home. okay but I don't know if the um, New, Ze- the New Zealand universities are all back but I know the Otago University um, students turn out well for those Highlanders games so there should be a good atmosphere this everyone celebrating good. being allowed out again um, I know that that won't have won off yet yeah that's good as I say, we'll see. I could just, I could just see my, my beloved Crusaders cutting them apart, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and then on Sunday, we've got the 4.35 kickoff. It's the Chiefs Hurricanes back in uh, Hamilton. Uh, Johnny, you want to start with that? Any initial things? Can the Chiefs get off the mark? Actually, well, both teams haven't yeah. won yet. So can the, can, who, <laughs> hopefully it's not going to be, well, it can't be a draw uh, because of the golden um, points rule. So who's winning it? Who's going to get their first win? The Chiefs really need it. And I think Kane, Sam came back. He's had a week. He's had a week in now. They'll be ticking more next week, I feel. And I think they should hope. I think they should win next week. I'd be confident they'd win. I don't think they'll win by a huge margin, 
I think it could be a high-scoring game, though, with these two teams. Um, they're not kind of the defensive teams that either the Highlanders or the Crusaders say are, so, yet. Um, so, I think um, uh, it, could be, it could be a high-scoring one, but I'd say the Chiefs should nudge it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the Chiefs, the, thing, the issue that we diagnosed early on was that their pack in the first, first two rounds was that their pack was really suffering and not really in the fight in the sense that you would normally expect from a pack like that. But Kane coming back and this match, this week's game is against the Crusaders, their pack was much, much stronger. They were putting in bigger hits. They were making better carries. I think as Arcoy and uh, the other second row get more used to these, um, basically getting more used to men's rugby, they can only get better. Um, I know Alan Marlowe was meant to start um, and was ruled out with a late illness. Hopefully he's over that and um, can finally play again next week. But that, then again, um, Nani Saturo and Wainui did pretty well this week. So the Chiefs aren't far away from being really as good as we, they are capable of being. They're not far off that. Um, they just need it all to come together against the right team that really isn't the Crusaders in the wet. So should be a good game. Yeah, and it'd be nice to see Lacton Blochier finally turn up. I don't feel he's really got going yet. Yeah, he's had some hard games. Mm. Yeah, from from a the Canes' point of view, uh, well, talking from a general point of view, actually, that these are the two teams that have underperformed. But when you look at, if you, aside from the Highlanders game, um, two teams that they probably wouldn't have either expected to have won against the Blues and the Crusaders, both playing very well at the moment. So, yeah, both teams really need a win. Um, Chiefs potentially more so than the Canes having played one more game, but they're both going to have to fight really hard. They're going to have to both need to win this or else they're going to struggle for the rest of this tournament. So, yeah, it's going to be really interesting, really exciting to watch. Yeah, yeah something we didn't really talk about in the, in the main body of this was Sam Kane coming back. He looks really fit and strong, actually. He's, been, he's, had, he's clearly had a good um, recovery from his injury. Uh, he's, he'll be key. I, I, at the moment, without seeing the teams, I can't make a prediction at the moment um, with who's going to take it. But it, again, they, but both sides need, it really do need a win. Um, so let's we'll sort of draw on, under the line for this uh, week on Super Rugby uh, Aotearoa. We're going to do a little uh, podcast now on Super Rugby AU. So access that if you would like to. But as I say, we'll see you on Friday for the preview of uh, round four of Super Rugby Aotearoa. Uh, please, as I say, with a lot of other podcasts uh, stopping for a summer break, do encourage your mates to go check us out with just four blokes with an opinion, but like to talk about rugby in a lot of detail. So please give us a share. We're on Acast, we're on Spotify. Uh, go check our Instagram and Twitter. And we're also on YouTube if you want to watch us and sit down. Uh, we'd really appreciate all the support and feedback you can give us at this time. Uh, as I say, stay safe and I'll see you uh, later in the week, lads. See you, Cheers. Cheers.